oh, I use XYZ. I think, um, okay, so we're being recorded. So hello everybody, my name is Jim Sapier. I'm a uh, main Department of Education Humanities teacher leader fellow, along with Dory Tripp who's joining us. Hi, I'm Dory, yep. <laughs> And so today we're going to talk a lot about gamification, and we're not we're not coming at this with a lot of answers. This is more of an exploratory, um, you know, uh, professional development where we can share, we can talk about gamification and share resources. So okay. I'll let Dory bring up our slideshow here, but um, you know, a lot of this hopefully will be discussion. All right. Can you see everything? Yes, now we can, yeah. Perfect. All right, so um, just to kind of kick off discussion um, today, we will just kind of touch upon a few things first. Uh, we'll kind of define like what gamification is um, and share some helpful resources to support um, gamifying curriculum in your classroom. And then Jim will share some of his examples that um, he's either seen or used in his classroom personally. I will do the same. Um, and then we'll have some time for open discussion, um, which could be anything from questions, um, sharing ideas, or even, oh, you know, sharing whatever it is that works for you in your classroom or, or things that you've tried. And then at the end, um, I will share a link to complete a very brief survey so that you can earn contact hours toward recertification for your time here today. So what is gamification? What do you think, Jim? So yeah, I um, I was trying to find a definition. This is sort of like AI, and then it's a sort of a whole new way to address how to educate. And uh, so there's not a ton of resources, not a ton of answers for people, but I think we all recognize the benefits when we're dealing and we're not dealing when we're working with students who, um, you know, their attention spans are changing. Their, you know, their exposure to media is is more in one day than many of our grandparents had their entire lives. And, um, and so there's a couple of resources here that you might um, be able to draw on and finding answers about gamification. There's Edutopia, of course, is a great resource for a lot of practical approaches to education. So if you want to click on that, Dory. And it talks about the benefits of this, and not the least of which I think is um, working uh, cooperatively. Um, you know, using your imagination and, oops, and, um, uh, you know, just actually being sort of, um, you know, involved both kinesthetically and intellectually in something. I, we always played lots of games with my kids when they're little, and so they're able to maintain their focus, uh, I think, a lot more. And so that becomes part of it as they have a, they have a more internal focus. It puts me in mind of a friend of mine I go disc golfing with who, uh, refuses to walk, but if you put a disc in his hand, he'll walk for 10 miles, right? If you make it something a game, you're a lot more likely to get a lot of out of them. So this gives you some, uh, you know, tips as well as some strengths that come out of being able to gamify what you're doing. Um, and then uh, probably the only really um, scholarly resource that I could find is the Berkeley Center for Teaching and Learning which goes into a more scholarly approach to gamification and why it should be considered. And they give you like it, uh, they give you some reasons, high performance and practical assignments enhances learning motiva motivation, which I think Jenna, you were talking about that with your students, um, how, you know, you make something a game and you get so much more out of them. Uh, encourages collabor collaboration, promotes learner engagement, and then it gives you some ways of, of doing this. Nothing really practical, just so much as uh, um, an overview of, of how to plan a, a game for your class. Uh, but I think in the end, really, it's just making education a game, something that helps them. I don't know if it's competitive, but something challenging that they can they can work out in a, in a fashion because they're always on, on games, right? Um, I think, so you when, know, most, right, sorry, Jim, to pop in, but just, you know, most students, um, 
you know, engage with the learning when they enjoy what they're doing, right? Um, especially, you know, I work with elementary school kids. So, um, you know, making the learning process as enjoyable as possible for them and engaging that process, like definitely helps them connect with the material and the curriculum for sure. Right. So some helpful resources, Jim, I think you curated a lot of these. I, um, sure I, I bet a lot of us have seen them. Yeah. <laughs> So I, I saw in some of yours, you have Kahoot. So I'll let you talk about that when we get to yours, because I haven't used it much, but I love book, look it. And is that, Jenna, is that what you're using today with your students? Um, I think it's look it. And yeah, um, uh, it, it was look it and I had never used it. Um, I'd always used Quizlet and I do the individual and the live and then Kahoot. But my students said, hey, can you try this? And I did, and um, they showed me how to do it. It was a huge success. Um, my son was using this in his um, in his anatomy and physiology class, and uh, they loved it. It's competitive, right? They they try and answer the questions as quick as they can. The great thing is, from what I understand, is that I haven't actually used it. I've, I've only heard about it. Is that you don't have to make it up, right? They have banks of of uh, activities that you can draw from, and then the students can review them. And I, and I think if you've already, it's either a Kahoot or a Quizlet, which mo those are kind of the two standards. I think that you can import from one of those. So, you know, if you've got those made up, then you can just put it in a book it relatively quickly, I think. Oh, that's interesting. Nice. Um, and uh, I know uh, Padlet is really useful. I've used, I've used just a minor aspect of it and organizing classes, but you can, you can use that to make, games i'm just not as familiar with that that part of the gamification but it does give you a forum where you can create activities for students to engage in and they can actually contribute as well to padlet as a, as a group so you can do it as sort of a community project um, so these are the ones i'm mostly aware of that students use and um, some of you may be able to speak to them but the real question i have that i was hoping to talk about is how can you a lot of these are for review right, to bring ideas that we've already taught to them so they can review them. I want to know what is a good way of, of using or, or finding tools or gamifying in order to teach a concept. Mm. I don't know if anybody has any answers for that. Well, I think, you know, these in particular, um, I know Kahoot is, that is the design of this particular game, right, is, is kind of like game show or review, you know, show what you know. But I mean, there are other types of games or other platforms that I think maybe work better for the teaching purpose than necessarily Kahoot. Although I bet there are some really savvy people out there who have figured out how to use Kahoot as a teaching resource and not just an assessment tool. Um, but there are some other um, resources that we are going to share later that might be more applicable for the teaching and learning part than just assessment. <clears throat> so Jim, do you wanna share some examples? Sure. sure, I have a couple of examples. I don't have a ton, but I, I do have some. And so um, we've recently, uh, a colleague and I have uh, created a, a cl after school club for Dungeons and Dragons. And uh, it's really making um, some headway in a lot of schools, the whole role playing. It, it sort of came to the forefront after Stranger Things became popular. But, it, you know, I played it as a kid and it came out in the 70s and 80s. And so it's the original role playing game, right? And, um, you know, it has so many strengths. You have to be imaginative, you have to work cooperatively, um, you know, you've got to try and read through stats and understand all of the way things come together. Uh, it's really a comprehensive game. And I know that's a lot of teachers have started using it to teach, right? To have students work cooperatively uh, within classrooms in order to engage and teach concepts. And so it's it's not just for an after school activity, it's actually for um, in the classrooms. And um, I think there's some, yeah, there's quite a few resources here that you can draw from that are geared just for educators. 
Uh, and it's put out by the Dungeons and Dragons. So it's a little self-serving. Obviously, they want to promote their game within curriculum because that's a big market. But um, they have some really good, um, you know, activities and some ideas. And they, they provide some good guidance on how to get a club started. Excuse me, how to get um, a license, what kind of books you need, if you're unfamiliar with it. They even have some curriculum suggestions that you can work with. They have downloads. And they have some videos as well. Uh, on how, and I think I include them in other places, how to incorporate them to teach reading, how to incorporate them to teach writing. Um, so they're really trying to promote this sort of gamification um, in, a, in a more productive way in the classroom. We have, um, at our school, we have something that's called a May term at the end of May and early June. It's the last three weeks and students take four classes and when they meet every day for an hour and a half and they get a quarter credit. But uh, well, two of the classes that they can take are Dungeons and Dragons and then Advanced Dungeons and Dragons, where they learn how to play and then they can learn how to create games. And the courses are, are always full and always quite popular. Awesome. Good. Right. So um, this is a review game I've had, like, I've had students now whose parents played this when I had their parents in class. So, so it's called Dinosaur Vocab because it's just... Um, we, I used to have dinosaur figurines in the classroom and we would use those as things they could they could grab and tap when it was their turn. So they'd go head to head and I'd give them a word from the vocab list and they would have to tap and tell me what the synonym or the definition is. And then, you know, they, their teams, they were on teams and they could get points. And um, I found, you know, obviously a lot of people would get into it. It became, in some cases, you know, cheering and, you know, streamers and everything. But, um, you know, it, it became, a, a, I do it all the time because I get much better results, right? The students learn the words. They want to do well, so they study them at least during the review part. And so you know, and so that's it's yeah. come to be. I don't have the dinosaurs anymore; they disappeared. But um, <laughs> we call it anyway. Um, and so uh, here are some games. Some of these uh, I've made up. Some I got from um, uh, Teachers Pay Teachers, the Escape Room. This is in my bio class, but I'm trying to adapt them for my English class. And I think the concepts are sound, even so we straight in the English. So uh, the escape room is simply that. It's just a layout where students have to figure out answers regarding whatever topic you have. And then that helps them go on to the next clue. And there's like five or six clues and it gets a whole series of, um, of challenges that they have to engage. And the kids love it. And I usually do it for a double um, whenever I, we're studying different concepts. And I wanna, I, like I said, I wanna try and engage uh, English with that. And it's a good review though, but um, it'd be a really interesting thing to try and teach using that concept where they have to learn new stuff in order to solve a problem. Mm. The next one is the, the Nancy game in the middle. Um, and um, if you, can you click on the, the, the oh, word above yeah. that? Sorry. This I got from a comics website because I teach comics as well, um, both as a May term and as, as part of a regular English class because um, it's a visual literacy unit that we do. And so we often use comics. Um, and so part of learning comics is understanding how the meaning comes from the way that panels transition to each other. And so this is a game where I took all these old Nancy comics, you may remember, and cut out panels, and then they have to use those in a card game that matches them and tries to um, satisfy the, the type of transition. So they roll dice, find out what kind of transition they have to use, and then they, they use something from their hand to suit that requirement. And so uh, they get some crazy stories, but it helps them really understand the concept as well. And then this is the mitosis game. Actually, I have students working on this now. I've done this in English too. Uh, this happened to be just the document that I had available. And so they have to, a series of different concepts they have to use and put into a game of their own fashioning. And so next, it's next Wednesday, they're actually going to play them in class as a form of review. And then we can go through and assess whether or not they touch all of the different elements of meiosis and mitosis. And I've done this with English, some books that we've read. And one time students came in after hours, they got a hold of the janitor and they got in and they transformed my whole room into a game. And so the next day in class, we got to play the game by walking around and going from one, you know, like a monopoly game, one place to the next and, and figuring out if we can move ahead. Um, and so, you know, that was really engaging and really interesting with students but like i said a lot of that's just re it's not just it's a form of review versus um teaching the concepts which is really what i'm trying to trying to work with 
Yeah, but I like the element of creation in there that students are are making something up rather than necessarily just playing a game. They're creating the game. And I think that's that's awesome. And they're really excited about it. And I think, you know, sometimes I will I will explain all these concepts and I think I'm being crystal clear. And then, you know, I give them a test and they have no idea what it's like. They never heard a word I said, whereas in this, they're excited about it and they're explaining concepts to each other. So in essence, they are learning it, right? They have the notes from me, like being in the book, but uh, to to really take it into their understanding. This is a great, works well. Awesome. And so my wife teaches elementary. She's been in kindergarten care for well over 20 years. And um, so I was asking how she uses games because she uses them all the time. She actually used one, I think it's a brain break. Um, you can see that they have a whole series of brain breaks you can take. And it, it's, uh, you know, some of this is just movement, some of it's teaching, um, different concepts. But uh, she said they were just crazy. They just loved it. It was a Pokemon one. I don't know if this is it, but um, <laughs> they have to run. So things are coming at them on the screen. And they have to jump to the side. Um, and so on some, there's obviously different interactive levels. So, so sometimes they're actually learning a concept and, and the activities deal with that concept. I don't know if this will if this will come in. But, Wayfair uh, helps all of us create a home we love. <laughs> Wayfair vibe at our place. But we all got our own thing. Drama. Glamour. So you have to run and things come at you. Yeah. Your job in level one is to help get Buddy the Elf to New York City. You'll need to pass through the seven levels of the Candy Cane Forest, through the sea of swirly twirly gumdrops, and then through the Lincoln Tunnel. Make sure to dodge all really of the Elf's be, main uh, food groups. An elementary Good luck. educator to super appreciate this. Like today we had indoor recess all day. She's great. Yeah. 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 My wife said, wow, they used to oh. have to dodge the jump, you have to the side. That's so fun. Yeah, she 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 loves it. And so she tries to she was giving me some other suggestions here. Um if you go back to the slide. Mm -hmm. Uh so Jack Hartman sings about things. He has a picture of them there. So he combines lessons with movement. So the kids love it. She does this simple dice roll where they have to show combinations in order to add to 12. Um you know, sight word bingo, where kindergartners are learning just a few words, and so they play bingo. Memory games, similar slight sight word. Um, so, you know, all of these great things that kids love, and uh, some of them they just go crazy for. So, mm -hmm. definitely. Well, great. Those are awesome. Thanks, Jim. Um, so, I am a elementary music teacher. So, the examples that I We'll be showing you from my classroom are definitely music content related. However, I think the general idea of these games can be easily adapted and they're probably versions of what I'm going to show you out there um, for other educators to use no matter the content area. Um, but uh, the way that I use games in my classroom usually um, is not just for like assessment, but actually to provide time for my students to practice a concept that we just learned um, for new learning. And only some of the things that I use are, you know, like online game based. Um, many things that I use are also actual physical manipulatives, paper based, things like that. So my favorite place to go to to find some of the collaborative um, games that we use in my classroom is Teachers Pay Teachers. There is um, a lot of free content in there, which just um, is fantastic uh, for educators. But um, I use them in kind of like centers rotations for elementary school. So after we've learned a concept, um, I break my students up into small groups and we rotate through different centers. I actually put bins out on my floor with the um, the activities right in them. Um, if we were doing the activity for the first time, I would teach them how to play the game as a whole group, a whole class. And then after that, 
Um, they could independently work in small groups. Um, and so some of the ones that I love the most are our card games like this one right here called Kaboom, kind of at the bottom of the screen. Um, there are rhythms. And I love this. Um, if you are a music teacher reading <laughs> uh, or watching this later, um, you know, this particular teacher right here, um, I think it's Becca's Music Room. Um, she's fabulous. She has a lot of games. Um, she gamifies her classroom a lot. But just like card games like this, um, where simple rhythms are in there, students take turns pulling a card out of the pile. They have to read or play the rhythm accurately. Um, and if they read it correctly, they get to keep the card. If they come up with this card that says kaboom, they have to put all of their cards back into the center, um, into the deck. And so um, it's kind of a game that never ends. Um, and it's great oops, um, because it gives students a chance to practice um, reading um, rhythms. So I think like an extension for this could be math facts, if like you're a math teacher or literacy term, you know, it, it, the possibilities are endless with this idea of kaboom. Um, there's also like other board game style things like a rhythm race, um, matching games. Um, one we like to use called shark attack, which is very similar to go fish. And again, kids have to read or sing or play the card that they um, pull out. And I like it too, because I can kind of rotate around and listen to kids as they're going through to see how they, I, I can use it as an informal or formal assessment, which is really helpful. Um, for individual assessments, I do like to use things like Kahoot. Um, Kahoot, I became aware of Kahoot, um, actually like during the pandemic mostly is when I had um, most of my experience using Kahoot, but I love it. It's another, I don't think I'm logged in here, but this is just another platform where Jim, you had touched on before there are, if you create an account, um, it's free. And then there's all kinds of already preloaded content in there. So I could log in and I can just type in like, Oh, I want a quiz on rhythm durations and I can find something that somebody already made or I could easily create one of my own um, assessments as well. And I, what really helps me as far as individual assessment um, is this students, you know, can create, they can use their real name or, you know, you could give them a nickname, but you can actually export the data or the answers afterwards to see how kids did either individually or as a group just to see if they grasped the concept and whether or not we need to go back and review that. They get really competitive with this game. Um, and I tend to use it mostly with my upper grades, um, but super fun game show style. Um, also, this is something you need to have a subscription with, but if you're a music teacher, I. Most music teachers I know already have a subscription to music play. It's very, very mainstream and common. Um, oops, did I not link it? I guess not. Uh, but music play online does have a whole section of um, four virtual games. Um, students, uh, I, I have an account and so I can give students um, a pin to come in through like my website and there's a whole bunch of games. So if we you are working, for example, at the beginning of the year, my fourth graders were working on pitch identification, identifying the notes on the music staff, the pitch names. There are several different games um, geared toward pitch identification, which is really, really fun. Um, and it's interactive and they can do it on an iPad or on a laptop. Um, and I have them just screenshot their score at the end and then send it to me, um, which is great if I wanted to just check in on how they were doing. Um, sometimes I set up an iPad in one of my centers, uh, a couple of iPads for students to work on that independently with headphones, and they love that um, technology piece. And then I also have a couple of games that I use with whole groups that 
gives it a game feel, but it really just helps me with tracking and I, um, incentivizing progress through units. So for example, my fourth graders are doing um, recorder. That's very common in fourth grade across elementary schools. Um, and so we use a curriculum called recorder karate. And um, it really is so motivating for them. Each song, it's leveled repertoire, and each song is linked up with a different color belt. So as they start to master the skills that they need um, to play these songs and they advance in the curriculum, they get like a little, um, I can actually grab one. Hold on. That one right here. I don't know if you'll be able to see, but um, on their recorders, they do put like little belts, their little rubber colored rubber bands at the bottom of their belts. Um, and that motivates a lot of students um, to even practice at home, which is great. They're making wonderful progress. And then last but not least at the bottom right-hand side of the screen, I um, my fifth graders in beginner band, we just started a game on my whiteboard called Bandy Land. And uh, each, um, each square, each section of my band, so like the clarinets, the flutes, the trumpets, the trombones, are working as a group to move across the game board and earn a set number of points by the end of the year before they head to um, middle school. And in each one of those blocks, this is one of those things, maybe Jim, that you had touched upon using a game to help learn new content. Each one of those blocks has something new that they have to master or learn. Um, some of them, it's just, you know, showing excellent rehearsal behaviors, you know, as we lead up to a concert. And then some of them are like, oh, you learning a new note or being able to play a concert B flat scale. Um, and so we work throughout until the end of the year. And this is just something I use to keep them motivated. Um, fifth graders sometimes tend to get a little bit of senioritis <laughs> um, toward the end of the school year. And so this, um, this keeps them motivated and competitive and it works really well um, for me in my classroom. So those are just some examples of, of what I use in my space. And again, I think any of these things could be modified not just specifically for music instruction but really for for any content so so i guess at this point should i stop sharing my screen jim for a minute so we can yeah, if we want to have an open discussion about exchanging ideas, sure. We have somebody new, Kelly Wallace. Thank you for coming, Kelly. I think you're able to talk. Um, I'm sorry if, I don't know if you can hear. I've got an after-school program outside my room right now. It's a little noisy. I don't know if you can hear all the, the kids shouting. Um, so I, at this point, really, because gamification is such a new concept, does anybody have any resources or ideas they want to share? I don't, I keep looking for more, right? And I keep trying to adapt um, what I know into my classes for gamification, but I don't also don't want to take away from, you know, the writing and the reading that I have to do as well. So, um, you know, it's a fine balance between, because <clears throat> I don't want, you know, teachers aren't entertainers, although, uh, you know, it seems like we're having to become that, but, um, you know, there has to be a balance between, you know, substantive content and, and gamification that's, and they can probably be combined in some way. It's just figuring out how to do it. I think too, you know, it has to be manageable. I don't know if this has ever happened to you, but you know, I have an idea and I'm like, oh, I want to try this with students. And then when you kind of get into it, it's like, this is really hard to maintain or it's not, it's a little bit more involved than like what, you know, we have time for or energy mm -hmm. for. So it, there, you're right. There is a balance, um, trial by error, I guess. Mm -hmm. And it's also, you know, planning uh, this uh, to make it meaningful. Sometimes it takes a ton of planning and, and for a teacher that just, there just may not be enough time between all the other responsibilities that we have. Mm -hmm. uh, 
I think that's a great point. That's why I kind of lean towards <clears throat> those probably overused, but still enjoyed uh, Quizlet and Cahoots and Booklet too, I think, because students, you can do it in class for like, you know, a do now, you can do it at the end uh, as kind of like a fun assessment, quick check, or you can assign it. So students do it as homework. And for some of my students who have um, a very clear aversion to homework, um, <laughs> that somehow is palatable. So it just engages them with the vocab and concepts and <clears throat> holds them accountable for a little bit of work outside of class. And if I just do one of those look at Quizlet or Kahoot, then I can use it both in class um, to engage, to assess, and also for homework. So I'm really looking for what's the biggest bang for your buck type of thing. Right. And one that we don't have to commit all of our time to, right? Jordan's just trying to create. Yeah. And I, I think look at right now is the one that, uh, you know, a lot of my colleagues are using and they're recommending to me too, as I, I try to do more gamification. How did you said you used look at uh, Jenna? How did that go well with your students? It went very well. And I had never used it before. My daughter, who's a 10th grader, um, says, oh, you should try it. You should try it. And I'm like, oh, I don't know. And so I said to my students, OK, we've got a new unit we're starting. And what like, what do you guys like? Um, and they're like, you've got to do book it. And so I did. And then I'm like, OK, which, you know, you get a choice of which game and I give them the choice. Um, and uh, they like that, you know, they're like, no, we want this game. And I'm like, well, we'll do two as review today and we can do this and this. And um, th it's actually more interactive than I realized, but sometimes not in a great way. They can actually, um, you know, do things that not only enhance their point value, but but detract from someone else's. And I'm like, oh, that's so mean. And they're like, no, that's how it goes. And I'm like, OK, all right, I get it. Mm -hmm. um, but. Yeah, it went really well. And I would not have done it if I, I just said to them, you know, we need something different. We're getting a little flat on uh, the cahoots and the quizlets. And so they were um, good at suggesting something else. Great. I know um, my son is a sixth grader and I don't, I've never used these particular things before, but he's come home. He's told me about his science teacher uses Minecraft for education on occasion mm -hmm. so he you can actually have like free student accounts through there um for his his science class and those are my son's like favorite days when they get to play in minecraft um so that's definitely one uh that i know that's out there as well and that's also i think kids buy into that because so many kids are playing minecraft at home a different version i guess but um that's another one Oh, Dory, that's interesting because we're just the unit we're starting is the Industrial Revolution. And they had said, oh, we do this with Minecraft. And I'm like, no Minecraft. But now yeah. and you just said that about your uh, your sixth grader. I don't know now. I'm like, and I had been on teachers paying teachers and been looking for kind of STEM because I work at a technical high school from STEM projects. And that came up as an option. So maybe I'll take a second look at it. Yeah, I think I do think there is like a whole education section, like Minecraft for education. Again, mm -hmm. I don't use it, so I I I, I can't um, say one way or another. But my son really enjoys it. Um, I also know too. So if um, you know, since we are the humanities, anybody out there in the foreign language, um, my son also. Um, for foreign language, it has a school or a class Duolingo account. Um, and that is definitely gamifying um, learning a language. And it's a lot of fun. Um, and it's very conversational, too. Um, and I think um, I just think back to like, you know, th there is a lot of important learning in there as well. But I, I think back to, you know, when I was a kid learning French and like learning how to conjugate all the verbs and, and things like that. Um, sometimes that can be a little bit, you know, just a lot of rewriting and dry work. And so gamifying that a little bit, Duolingo is a lot of fun. So. Yeah. I, I've heard a lot about Duolingo recently. It's, it, 
And I think a lot of schools are using it because they can't find the foreign language teachers, mm -hmm. right? So they have like a tech, um, um, a, you know, an ed tech come in. I don't mean to diminish that title. I, I think schools have different titles for them, but somebody who's not uh, a natural language teacher and um, and then they, they just sort of monitor their kids as they engage in Duolingo. And um, I guess it might be working for them really well. And, and I think what people like about that too is it's like individual progress too. You mm -hmm. can kind of work at your own pace and you you are incentivized by winning like badges and and coins and things like that. So interesting. Okay. Does anybody know of any blogs? Any kind of anybody that's doing this in a more formal way of putting out gamification methods and uh, and resources? But really, I, I was looking for one for this presentation because, of course, we're all new to this, but uh, mm -hmm. maybe we should start one because I can't find any. James, I, I was thinking about that Nancy card game. Uh, do, do the cards come prepared or do you create them? So I, I actually bought a Nancy book and I copied all of those pages and I cut each one out. Well, and then I... I used my wife's laminator and I cut them all out after that. Yeah. So it was, it took a while, but uh, it was a labor of love because I absolutely love comics. You know, I, I was wondering about doing something for history. Um, and I was thinking of like, you know, just having a bunch of different turning points of causes and effects of, um, kind of, you know, the creation of certain innovations and inventions that have changed history and putting them on a card with a bubble and then having students fill in the text uh, and or pictures, which would be kind of cool because many students are artistic or many students, but not maybe so good with literacy. Many students are great writers, but not with art. They could actually kind of pair up or do one part and then we could create our own comic strips for you know I would say okay here are 20 turning point events in world history create a comic strip with the four and I don't know I, at least then they'd be I like it because it's um you know it's well, it's sort of hands-on it's artistic and also yeah. it's a good review and and they're involved in the in the creation, which I think is really key. Yeah, is to get them to to put because they're more likely to remember it, right? If they put the time in. Right. Right. I did want to show you um, something. I remind if I I'm going to share my screen here if I can um, get back to the. Here we go. Um, if you've heard of the um, uh, timeline game. I have not. So can you see the screen? Can you see this? I can. It's a, yeah, it's a little tin. I got this because um, my brother-in-law actually gave it to me for Christmas a couple of years. And it's essentially a little tin that's full of cards throughout time for this period in time. And then somebody puts a card down it, and then you have to put one down whether it goes before or after this date. And then oh. you work down until it actually, you get to points where it's like a couple of years and it's hard for students to realize where they go within this this timeline. Mm. Oh, I love it. That's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Hmm. Cool. And so I've done that with my kids, right? It's, and you know, it's, I got, I got all different kinds, right? So it might be inventions and they have to put them in order of when they came or, uh, you know, architecture. So they have a lot of different events that you can, anyway, but that was a really, that'd be a really good tool for a, a civics class or a history class. Definitely. So but, uh, that's pre-made, right? I think that it'd be more meaningful if you if you make your own cards and then the students have to work with those. It might be good to uh, purchase it and just have them play it for a couple of weeks and then they can make their own just so they could kind of have a template, but also do their own thing, own flavor to it. Right, right. And they would love it, I think. And my kids loved it. And, um they just, they have, sometimes they, they have these misconceptions in their head and they realize just how far off they are when they put them down, like when the cards down in order. Yeah. That's great. All right. Any other thoughts? 
I just think like the possibilities are endless. I think initially when I first, when we first started talking about, oh, let's, you know, dive in and look into gamification a little bit. At first thought for me, it was for some reason, just like technology, like online games that your students could go on. But um, realizing like, oh, I actually do a lot of gamification already and not really realizing it until we dived right in. And it, it doesn't have to be with technology and it doesn't have to be with devices. I mean, and, you know, some some of it can be so simple, um, but just is enough for students to engage a little bit and, and interact with the learning in a different way. Um, so that was encouraging. I love it when we look into a topic and I'm like, oh, wait, I do that. You know, it's, it's very, um, it's very validating and reassuring. <laughs> yeah, I should be, be instant. Years ago, I, I would cut up an essay and then the students would have to recreate it and put it back together line by line and explain, okay, why do you think it goes in this order? So mm -hmm. I think that's a, it's, it's sort of coming into its own, that sort of approach at this point. Mm -hmm. so Students are more engaged by it. Yeah. Well, if you have nothing else, um, Gina, I did put um, the link to our Google form. It's just a very quick survey uh, to receive contact hours. And if you fill that out, I will. We will send you a certificate for your time. And then I'm just going to share my screen one more time, Jim, just for our contact information. Um, if you think of anything else um, or have questions or would like us to include something, um, we'll have a section on our website um, about this that we can come back to, just kind of a hub for resources. Um, this is our contact information. as well as a link to our website. I'll actually right, click folks. on Yeah, um, I just real quick, just to show you where our website is within the DOE website. This is what our website looks like. So we do have a lot of resources in there, past newsletters, um, events coming up. So feel free to check that out. That's where all of this that we talked about today will be living after tonight. Awesome. Thank you guys so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Jana. Thanks for joining us. All right. Stop the recording. Okay. So long, everyone. Thank you.